Namaste, everyone. I begin with offering my humble pranams and deep gratitude to Sri Aurobindo and the Mother, the two who are one, who are the secret of all power and are the might and right in things. It's they who have brought us all together this evening. To them, we offer this humble effort of ours. On behalf of Bharat Shakti, Sri Aurobindo Society, and our partners for this evening's symposium, Orochit, Sakshi, and La Grace Integral Life Center, it is my privilege to welcome you all to this exploration of the Veda and the Vedic spirit. My name is Belu Mehra, those of you who are um, don't know me, and I head a department at Sri Aurobindo Society called Bharat Shakti which is dedicated to research and program development in the areas of Indian culture in the light of Sri Aurobindo's vision for the future of India. We are guided by his Rishi Drishti into the deepest truths of the Indian soul that have shaped her culture, her civilization, and his clear vision that he has laid out for us for India's destined work for the future of humanity. Even the name of our department, Bharat Shakti, is inspired by his words, where he speaks of each nation as a Shakti or power of the evolving spirit of humanity. And he says, each nation that is the Shakti, it lives by the principle that is embodied by that uh, particular conception, the particular aspect of the evolving spirit. And India, he says, is the Bharat Shakti the living energy of a great spiritual conception. And it's the fidelity to this great spiritual conception, which is the very bedrock, the very principle of her existence. And that is what has given India this unique um, characteristic of being one of the immortal nations. And this great spiritual conception is, you know, the fidelity to that, the living embodiment of that is the secret of the amazing persistence and capacity of Bharat to renew, constantly, perpetually renew herself. And so as I was thinking about uh, what we are trying to do through this symposium today, I felt that uh, it's really how beautifully aligned this is with the spirit of this ideal that's been given to us by Sri Aurobindo. Now, in the next couple of hours, we will try to uncover and reflect on what is this great spiritual conception, which is at the bedrock, the foundation of what we know as Indian culture or Bharatiya Sanskriti? And how does this work as a force of Bharat's continued revival and rejuvenation, or as Sri Aurobindo puts it, India's rebirth or Indian renaissance? So uh, the moment we speak of the bedrock, the foundation of Indian culture, if there is one word that quickly comes to mind is Veda. And Sri Aurobindo has reminded us that it was the Veda that was the beginning of our spiritual knowledge and the Veda will remain its end. <clears throat> Since January of this year, January 7th to be precise, um, many of us in the group today, we have been part of a study group called Discovery and Application of Veda which began with an initiative taken by Orochit, which is uh, primarily a US-based group of seekers that are focused on study of Veda. And Navaketan ji and Shobhik from Orochit will be perhaps sharing more about, towards the end of the symposium, about this study group and uh, how this whole journey began. But I want to just take this opportunity to express how rewarding and uh, deeply inspiring it has been to collaborate with you, um, Orochet, as well as Sakshi, uh, on the programs that we've been we've done so far, which includes the five uh, webinar series on the theme "What is New in Sri Aurobindo," mm -hmm. and then another three session series on Sanatan Dharma. And through that, the idea of this uh, study group also came into being. So. Um, I don't know. It's so. It's since January. It's been now um, six, uh, almost eight months, and we thought that as a next step to synthesize some of what we are studying and learning in this group, and also with an intent to reach out to a wider audience, we thought 
it would be good. It was good time to organize a more um, structured event like today's. And um, so what we will, in, what today's symposium will include uh, will be two keynote speeches. We will be hearing from Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko from La Grace Shurabindo Integral Life Center, US, and Dr. Alok Pandey from Shurabindo Ashram Pondicherry. He will be joining us uh, a little later on. And the program will also include a moderated discussion and interaction session, which will be led by Dr. Nagendra from Sakshi. And we shall also have some Vedic chanting by Sri Ganesh Sharma from Sakshi. So before we begin with the formal program, I thought I would like to take no, no. Um, a few minutes. Yes, is that? Okay, I can click that. So let me just take a few minutes to share a few thoughts on why I feel or why, you know, in some of our discussions, it has also come about that why we think it's important to consciously engage with such a deeper exploration of the Veda. Why this, the very ra rationale for this study group and what we are doing today through this symposium. And for me personally, the answer to this is also found in the words of Sri Aurobindo. And uh, he says that if there is the first, the very first or the most essential work that um, of India's rebirth, of Indian Renaissance, if there is one, that is the recovery, these are his words, the recovery of the old spiritual knowledge and experience in all its splendor, depth, and fullness. Now, we are all gathered here as children of Mother India, regardless of our national ethnic identities or the place of residence. Somehow in our hearts and souls, we identify ourselves with the, the timeless spirit of Bharat this eternal dharma that Bharat holds on to, Sanatan dharma. And so it's natural that we must be concerned with this most essential work that Sri Aurobindo speaks of for India's rebirth. And in so many ways, it was Sri Aurobindo himself who led this work of recovering and renewing and uh, revealing for us this old spiritual knowledge and experience in all its splendor, fullness and depth. He gave to humanity what, in his own words, the true truth of the Veda, the profound and the deep spiritual knowledge experience that were, that had gotten hidden in this, as if in some sort of a coded language in the sacred mantras of Veda were decoded by Sri Aurobindo for us. And What's important to know is that this was not merely an intellectual recovery. That's what makes all the difference. It was not even a philosophical reinterpretation. It was a realized recovery for him, if I can put it that way. He realized in his own being the profound truths, the profound spiritual experiences which were sung by uh, Vedic rishis in these sacred hymns. He himself ascended to those highest levels of consciousness that the Vedic rishis were speaking of. And that's how he revealed for humanity the secret of the Veda. So just to give an example, um, so in the Veda, we find repeated references to the image of the spiritual life of man as a sacrifice, a journey, and a battle. And um, But in order to make it concrete to themselves and also to veil the secret of this journey, this sacrifice. Uh, the Vedic rishis, you know, the, they, they veiled the, some of these secrets, especially because they knew that a lot of people were not ready, did not have the adhikar yet to receive the truth of these deeper mysteries. So they expressed it all in poetical language, as point, symbolic images, poetical images that were drawn from the outward life that they saw at that time. So, um, you know, again, now Sri Aurobindo, who is the Rishi of the modern age, he speaks of this journey, um, this battle, this sacrifice in Savitri, in these lines, such a Vedic uh, imagery he gives us in these lines, because he's writing it for today's reader, today's audience. 
So this is how he describes that journey. A greater world time's traveler must explore. At last he hears a chanting on the heights and the far speaks and the unknown grows near. He crosses the boundaries of the unseen and passes over the edge of mortal sight to a new vision of himself and things. He is a spirit in an unfinished world that knows him not and cannot know itself. The surface symbol of his goalless quest takes deeper meanings to his inner view. His is a search of darkness for the light, of mortal life for immortality. So all the images and symbols that were used by the Vedic rishis, Sri Aurobindo tells us, can be interpreted at the spiritual level, at the cosmic level, at the psychological, and even at the physical level. So the Vedic vision that he's revealed for us, he's revealed the complete or the integral truth of that. Um, even the smallest details of the Vedic yagna, the fire sacrifice, Sri Aurobindo explains beautifully how, what deep symbolic and psychological significance um, are there in that. And um, the Vedic rishis, the worlds that they speak of, the worlds within and the worlds without, which include um, godheads, powers, visions, experiences of planes of consciousness, with most of which we, in our normal day-to-day -day experience, we are not even cognizant of that or even familiar with that. And it's Sri Aurobindo's voluminous writings on Veda that can help us decode some of these symbols and images. So through our symposium, we will be learning about some of these, um, you know, this, this decoding that Sri Aurobindo has done for us. Um, we'll be hearing about what is the core Vedic vision? What is this? What was this Amrit or immortality that the Vedic rishis were seeking? They were in quest of and what was the sadhana path, the Vedic yoga, through which they were striving to ascend to these higher planes of consciousness? There are so many Vedic terminologies whose uh, deeper meanings have been revealed for us by Sri Aurobindo, whether it is Go or Ashwa, Ratha, or uh, Satyam, Ritam, Brahat, or the word that most of us are familiar with. What is this Sat, Ekam Sat? as you know the famous line that most of us are familiar with ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti or even for that matter the term arya itself what is the truth of this term that we find in the veda so there are so many questions like that about the inner psychological um, psych uh, and the occult meaning of the vedic yagna how is it that this idea of vedic yagna becomes the foundation of the indian um, even sociological vision of life and the true aim and the meaning of human life. Who are these Vedic godheads that the rishis invoke, that the rishis invite to be born in them? Who are, what is Agni? What does that, what does Agni represent or symbolize for us in our spiritual quest? Who is Indra? Who are the Vedic deities of Sarma, Saraswati and Ila? What do they represent? What about the Ashwins and Maruts, the Varuna, Mitra, Vayu, so many things. Well, how, how do these gods and goddesses help us in our seeking, in our spiritual journeys? So we hope to uncover some of these um, answers as well through this program, through this symposium. Now, before we move on to our first speaker for the evening, let me recall some important words from Sri Aurobindo which actually help us understand the true reason why we are engaged in this work this evening and through our study group. So he's written about perfection of knowledge. And he says perfection of knowledge is the right condition for perfection of nature and efficiency of life. So there is a very practical reason that he speaks of as to why we must understand the Vedic vision in its depth. The perfect truth of the Veda, he says, is the fundamental knowledge. The right relations with the truth of things on which alone all other knowledge can receive the true orientation needed by humanity. 
And then he goes on to say something very important. He says the recovery of the perfect truth of the Veda is therefore not merely a desideratum for our modern intellectual curiosity. This is the key. Is not merely something that we desire to satisfy us intellectually, but it is a practical necessity for the future of the human race. He adds, for I believe firmly that the secret concealed in the Veda, when entirely discovered, will be found to formulate perfectly that knowledge and practice of a divine life, to which the march of humanity, after long wanderings in the satisfaction of the intellect and senses, must inevitably return. So this is the practical need, the practical necessity for why it is so important to engage consciously with the true truth of the Veda as revealed to us by Sri Aurobindo. Because on the basis of that, we'll be able to formulate perfectly the knowledge and practice of a divine life. So with that brief introduction, um, I now invite and request Shobhik who is the, one of the core team member of Orochit to introduce our first speaker, Vladimir Ji, who is with us. And uh, just to briefly introduce Shobhik. Shobhik currently lives in Florida, USA, and he describes himself as a spiritual toddler. I guess that's something that can be applicable to all of us who's trying to find his roots. So Shobhik, take it away. Uh, thank you, Beludi. And, uh... Uh, it was a beautiful uh, opening introductory remark. Uh, I guess all of you would agree. Um, and we can any any time. I would say it's not it's not easy for us not to get swayed when it's Sri Aurobindo and the mother mother's words uh, being uttered uh, so profoundly and beautifully. So thank you again, uh, Beludi, and to Sri Aurobindo Society. Um, allow me to introduce um, Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko. Uh, the director of the Institute for Applied Research and Integral Studies at the Sri Aurobindo Integral Life Center, USA. He holds a master's degree in linguistics and in Sanskrit language and literature and a PhD in Indian philosophy. So Dr. Yatsenko is an instructor of Sanskrit and an educator and researcher in Vedic and Vedantic studies. Uh, I want to add that he, along with Dr. Nagendraji, uh, has been a friend, philosopher, guide, and mentor to all of us in the Orochit group. And, uh, you know, we meet uh, weekly uh, towards our larger mission and vision of the discovery and application of Veda, as Biludi was alluding to. And uh, I want to invite uh, Dr. Vladimir uh, Yatsenko now for the Vedic vision in the light of Sri Aurobindo. Over to you, Vladimir. Thank you, Shobik. Thank you, Bello. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is a very special occasion to speak on these matters, which matter. Uh, and um, uh, to not to lose much time, I will go straight to the Vedic paradigm, yes, because we know about the Veda quite a bit. And the whole idea of recovering that link between uh, the a transcendental world in this world is the major topic of the recovery of the Vedic knowledge. And it is very close to integral yoga in a way, yes. So that split, uh, that um, loss of the supermind was, uh, took place because of certain um, incapacity, Shabindu says even because of failure of Vedic rishis to activate the supramental force here and transform human life, and most probably because of uh, humans, uh, human beings were not ready for this transformation yet, and uh, the, their psychic beings were not mature enough, probably. I'm just gathering this from the readings of Sri Aurobindo and the mother, that that failure took place, failure to transform earthly life by the spirit. Though the attempt was made, 
and it never reached its climax. So because of that, the split took place onto the east and west, onto Indian tradition, uh, which took, you know, the direction towards the Mayavada and uh, illusionism, um, looking at the spirit as the true and only reality and nature as the illusion and something we have to get rid of. And the other half went into Semitic tradition where tradition took charge of uh, or direction towards the manifestation of power in nature and uh, which led us eventually to the alchemists and then to the science and to all Western civilization, which accepts uh, the manifestation in nature and forgets the spirit. <laughs> this split took place, we could see it, materialism of the West, it is inbuilt in the West, and the spiritualism in the East, in India. We see this split. By the way, this um, also symbolized by Sri Aurobindo's symbol of uh, two traditions coming back together, as we know. Yes, we have the David star, which is Semitic tradition, and we have the lotus of the avatar, which is Vedic tradition. So put together, we bring back together power and knowledge, which got split over time. And they got split for the reason, uh, because the activization of the supermind was, um, was not easy, was not possible. This path of activating the spirit within our life, as Shobindo beautifully says, the Veda proper is karma kanda, not jnana kanda. Its aim is not moksha. Moksha means get rid of nature and disappear in spirit. Its aim is not moksha, but divine fulfillment in this life and the next. Therefore, the Vedic Rishis accepted plenty and fullness of physical, vital and mental being, power and joy as the pratishtha, or foundation of immortality and did not reject it as an obstacle to salvation. So it's a totally different paradigm, yeah? paradigm of oneness of spirit and nature. Even more so, nature was seen as the enterprise of the spirit. And so I want us to understand how that link supermind between the transcendental and this between two hemispheres of spirit and nature uh, got lost and why that recovery is so important and the recovery of the Veda is the recovery of that link and that what Sri Aurobindo speaks about to us so I will can I make a projection I do not have uh, permission I guess um, it would be easier for you to see because it's a... Yeah, yeah. do you see a share screen option, Vladimir? Yes, but I am not co-host. Can, can uh, I yeah, share? Yeah, you can. Go ahead now. I have made no. you. You can share now, Vladimir. You can share, okay, yeah. Good. Do you see the, yeah, the Vatican? Yes, program. yes. So I will just select a few slides because of lack of time, and I would rather open to the discussion than uh, just overload you with the information. So the Vedic paradigm is very interesting because this is the beginning, the, the bedrock of all our spirituality, of all our religions which followed later. So the faculties of consciousness in the Veda are seen as projected from the Divine Mother. Coming back to the Mother is also very essential, Aditi, infinite consciousness force. The supreme emanations of that consciousness force are called Adityas the sons of Aditi. They can be called also as the faculties of Aditi, not necessarily the sons, but the, you know, the energies of uh, the Divine Mother. There are seven of them, Varuna, Mitra, Aryaman, Bhaga, Daksha, Amsha, and Surya. You know these great godheads, they are all Adityas in the Veda, seven of them. Later there are 
more of them. There is also Vivasvat included. I can say a few words about Vivasvat. So Vivasvat was the eighth son. And this myth is uh, very well known in the Veda. He was born as the Martanda, as a dead embryo. And when Aditi, with her seven sons, saw him so distorted and Martanda, dead embryo, basically, he, she turned away from him and left him alone. So she, he never knew his mother. And this Vivasvat, as the word says, Vivaswan, the one who is shining vast, then turned to be the sun. And this is the sun which was kind of stolen or taken by the um, Asuras and uh, hidden in uh, the in the subconscious or in conscient um, darkness. So from there he started his journey. So inside, in the depths of our darkness, there is a luminous sun, and that luminous sun has to be recovered. This is the whole secret of the Veda, that in the depth of the darkness, there is the divine, which must be recovered. So these four, um, Sri Aurobindo speaks of in these terms, it is his words. Varuna represents the vastness of infinite being, Sat. Mitra, the luminosity and harmony of consciousness, Chit. Aryaman, the power of the divine tapas. Bhaga, the bliss of the divine fulfillment, Ananda. So, and then there are three other godheads. Daksha represents the power of thought, all discerning and all distributing power of supramental consciousness. Amsha represents the diversity in oneness, supported by the unifying power of Daksha. So it is actually one in many in many in one. Amsha itself, the word says, a portion, portion of something bigger and also uh, belonging to that oneness. <laughs> so one in many in many in one. And Surya or Savitar, after Surya Savitri, represents all seven Adityas. It's interesting, each Aditya, so there is no Mitra without Varuna, let us say. There is no Aryaman without Varuna and Mitra. So there is no Surya without six Adityas before. They are all in him. And uh, uh, the Vivasvat, the eighth son, Martanda, embodies all seven sons and is hidden in the darkness, which has to be recovered. So the whole fullness of transcendental has to be recovered. So if you look at this... Um, uh, known paradigm to us already in the Gita. This is a Gita's vision. And uh, we can see this Paraprakriti and Aparaprakriti, higher and lower hemisphere, and Vijnana supermind in between. It's also the paradigm of Taitiriya, yes. Taitiriya comes to Ananda, and then Chit and Sat also interestingly mentioned that. So, as yes, you remember, Annam Brahmeti Vyajanat and so on by one, one by one, prano, brahmeti, vyajanat. So he, Bhrigu, realized step by step all the levels of consciousness up to Ananda. And there he stopped, and that was the Bhargavi Varuni Vidya. It was the knowledge of Bhrigu. And Bhrigu is the main rishi of the all dynasties of rishis, of the ancient rishis, yeah? before Angira's rishis. So it's quite interesting, his father was Varuna, the divine purity and vastness of the divine being. He was teaching him about Brahman, how Brahman is manifesting the worlds here. What is interesting here is this Vijnana link, about which was lost. That Vijnana is a dynamic link which holds Satchitananda in it and also Manas Prana and Annam in it. It's like six cornered star of Sri Aurobindo yeah? with a square in the middle which is Vijnana. If you 
superimpose Shirobinda symbol on this, you will see absolute one-to-one -one kind of correspondence. And here within the Vijnana, in the depth where all the higher and lower hemisphere come together, there is someone, the supreme, the Purushottama, yeah, who is beyond all this, who is neither uh, Satchitananda in its fullness, nor Manas Prana and Annam exclusively. He is both high and lower hemisphere and something more than that, beyond both, transcendental to the transcendental, as uh, uh, Katha Upanishad would say, yeah. and also Shvetashvatara, transcendental to the transcendental, parat paraha. It's something very interesting definition. So there is this, this transcendental, and beyond it there is someone else, and Purushottama. Uh, if you look at it from the Atman point of view, we have the same. Atman is the self-awareness of Brahman, so to say. We have a self now. Uh, within the Brahman, as it were, as in uh, the Yoni, Samam Brahma, Mama Yoni, as Krishna would say in the Gita. And um, uh, it is the self-awareness of Sat Purusha, Chaitanya Purusha, Ananda Maya Purusha, Vijnana Maya Purusha, Mano Maya Purusha, and Prana Maya Purusha, Ananda Maya Purusha, all Purushas. And my Ananda Maya Purusha is my physical body, my Prana Maya Purusha is my vital body, which is vast and bigger. And then there is Mano Maya Purusha, the mental body, which is carrying this vital and physical, there is supramental body, beyond and beyond the bodies, which are all included into the Vijnana. Now, if you look at uh, the, <clears throat> we spoke about this, um, at the Vedic paradigm. So it's interesting that the Divine Mother projected these seven sons, which kind of were mirrored in the lower hemisphere, in time and space, let us say, and her twin sister, um, Diti, she is Aditi, and the Diti is the separative consciousness, holds mirroring the transcendental within herself, as it were, in time and space. So Varuna, which is uh, Sat, which is the divine existence, uh, is turned into the lower hemisphere, the lowest. It is the material manifestation of the substance of something which is the being. The being in time and space is matter. It's kind of amazing to think of it, you know, in that uh, way. And so Mitra Aryamana accordingly will be Prana, so there will be correspondence. But what is interesting here is that Surya is projected into the hidden sun in the darkness, which manifests the whole time and space continuum here. And we have this triple overmind, which connects us to the triple, and this is triple, though there are four, because Mitra and Aryaman will be here, the prana, and the triple uh, lower hemisphere of the mind, life, and body. So this is not spelled out in the same way in the Veda. Nobody explains these things. You have to figure out by yourself with references to Sri Aurobindo and his keys, slowly we get to this idea where all these new ideas of this, what we refer to later in the post-Vedic and post-Vedantic literature in the Gita, are taken from. They are taken from here. It is the same paradigm of knowledge. It's continuation of the same knowledge in different structures of consciousness, in different languages, in different articulations of the same idea. Now, this Surya Savitri, which is a uh, uh, supermind, generates these rays, and there are beautiful hymns where, where the light of the sun is met by darkness for the first time, and the light of the sun, the sun's body, pervades the darkness 
And when he pervades the darkness, the rays come into being. <laughs> so the rays are the extension of the sun into the darkness, yeah, which meets the body of the sun. It's quite amazing. Yeah? Even physically, if you, if you analyze that, how those photons were generated, you know, they come from the core and there is the whole program on the sun, how sun functions. And then they move through plasma because the pull, gravitational pull is so strong that the photon cannot really, that, that uh, gamma radiation, which is very dangerous, very powerful, cannot really leave the body of the sun. So it is pulled back. And for million years, that gamma radiation cannot leave the body of the sun. It tries and, and it generates heat in the sun, this plasma. Yeah? And then when it, when it loses its energy, to the extent that it can drop out, then it reaches the surface, and then it is, kind of, even then it is pulled sometimes back yeah, in the clusters, but then it is released into the space, into the darkness, and that is, then it is not so dangerous anymore for Earth, it becomes more, you know, supportive of bringing warmth and all what is necessary for Earth. Amazing. If you think of it, supermind, the sun, it's a physical replica of the supermind. So these rays of the sun meeting the darkness, and then they build these three rochanas, three uh, luminous realms of the sun, as Shirban says. Yeah? Uh, the rays, the, the realm of the rays of the sun, and that is overmind. And overmind is triple, three rochanas. Yes. <clears throat> there is the supramental of a mind, of a mind, the closest to the supermind, the first outburst of light into the darkness. And then there is overmind proper, where light is still in clusters, yes, universally. And then it is spelled out in the intuitive mind, in intuition, into the rays which work in time and space for particular purpose. It's quite amazing if you think of these. So three rochanas projected into tisro diavach, three heavens. We have three heavens of the mind. And this is all from the Rig Veda, you know, that from here we take this knowledge, from here, this knowledge we find also in the Semitic tradition. You know? So we have triple mind. Triple mind is our illumined mind, our uh, higher mind, and our proper mind. You know? These are three heavens. And then we have three Rajamsi or three Rajamsi in the Vedic language, three flaming realms of the vital. <laughs> Notice all of these words are something have to do something with light. Yeah? Three Rochanas, three shining realms, three Srodhyavach, Tisrodhyavach, Dyavach from Div to shine. Again, th three shining realms. In three Nirajamsi, three flaming realms. <laughs> so also full of light, but they are on the vital level. And on the vital level, we have our emotions, feelings, and sensations. Three chakras, Yana Hatha chakra, the Manipura, and Swadhisthana. These three realms of the vital are also mentioned. And then the, there are three physical realms, Tisro Bhumi, physical, and it's amazing also. So if I uh, project this in the one particular slide, and maybe here I will stop, closer to stop, I guess my time is up, um, then you will see the whole picture of the world, these triple worlds. So we have, and this is the terminology now of the mother. I just laid out for you the Vedic vision, and now I impose, I take mother's terminology, which Sri Aurobindo is using also. So the triple mind, we have mental mind, vital mind, physical mind. Then we have the vital, triple vital. We have mental vital, vital proper, physical vital. These, this is torso, this is our head, and this is our legs. Then we have mental physical, which is Kundalini, place of our uh, Manipura chakra.
what I'm saying, uh, of our Muladhara chakra. Manipura is here, vital, vital. Muladhara chakra is mental, physical, at the bottom of the... And then we have two more chakras on the level of the knees and on the level of the feet. Mother speaks of these two chakras, which are not mentioned in the tantric tradition because to come to that level of consciousness is nearly impossible. You have to be really uh, with supramental consciousness, most probably, to really be able to see and notice those chakras. Though we have many diseases connected to the knees and feet, burning feet, we cannot sleep, and so on and so forth. It's quite interesting that they are there, active physical chakra, proper physical is below the feet, vital physical, our vitality, physical vitality in the knees. Amazing, knees, yeah, always fail when we become older. When the, when the physical starts to fail, knees fail dramatically. You cannot walk anymore. You need a stick. And then mental physical is that um, um, very at the bottom of our spine, the center. So look how beautifully it is composed, a human being. We have the head, Sahasrara chakra, mental mind. Vital mind is Ajna chakra. And uh, physical mind is uh, Swadi, uh, the... Um, uh, Vishuddha chakra, which expresses the mind in the physical terms, physical mind, yeah? speaking, speech, amazing. This is the head, then the torso, triple chakra, anahata chakra, which is mental vital, higher vital, vital which is, how to say, painted with the mental idea, it becomes an emotion, it's more refined than the simply the feeling of the vital vital and then we have uh, vital vital the navel proper yeah uh, manipura chakra the crack between the worlds this is the crack which separates upper and lower within this heaven and earth where it cracked yeah? through which all the forces come in uh, and that's why it's navel interestingly it connects us to the embryo life and then we cut and we live separately from the mother, from the embryo life. And the same navel connects us to the physical world, to the subtle uh, vital uh, body, which is when cut we die, when the separation of the vital body from the physical takes place in the same navel and the same, this uh, Manipura chakra, chakra of the flame, of the fire, it is that fire which cracked the worlds, yeah? cracked our. So, and then we have the physical vital, which is that Swadhisthana chakra, which connects all the energy, 72,000 nadis, into the physical body. All the vital energies are managed by slightest capillars and movements of vital energy in the physical. That's why it is physical vital, uh, sensations feeling um, itchy, feeling hot in the body, all those energies which are within the body, nervousness, nervous system. And then there is triple three points of our legs. And if you separate these three parts, you will see beautiful three in three. And what I want to say, when we go beyond these three, we come to three rochanas, we come to the intuitive mind and then over mind and then supramental mind and beyond there is a triple super mind and the triple super mind is shirobindo describes as unity one in many in many in one and many within this is the triplicity notice this triplicity is projected immediately into the over mental realm where there is more unifying diversifying and diversified and that is projected into our mind, which is more unifying, our vital, which is diversifying, and the physical, which is totally diversified. Physical is the most interesting formation because there is nothing here in the physical world which replicates oneself. So everything is uniquely 
manifested here. Yeah? There is no, this, no same fingerprint, there is no same pebble on the shore, there is no same leaf in the forest of trees. You cannot find same form, same physical embodiment. It's all infinitely different, infinitely unique, that many is the infinity incarnate. You see, in all possible varieties. So, and it's interesting that within the physical, we have unifying element, diversifying and diverse. In the vital, we have unifying, diversifying and diverse. And in the mental, the same. We have the mental, which is more unifying, which is more dynamically diversifying, and finally expressing it in time and space as speech. Now, what it tells us, this is the Vedic paradigm, yeah? it tells us this triple three times three, the full system of numbers, by the way, also very interestingly, three families of threes, is um, what in the Veda uh, we call them as um, the Navagva Rishis, Rishis of nine rays. Sri Bindu refers to this, actually. <laughs> I'm taking it from him. Uh, so Navagva Rishis are Rishis of these nine rays, and they achieved full manifestation, full, how to say, realization in possible within this time and space, within the physical and mental body. Yeah? This is a fullness of realization, and they need to break to the Svar world. And breaking to the Svar world is possible only with the help of Indra, and Ayasya Rishi invokes Indra. And these Navagva Rishis, Rishis of nine rays, become Dashagva Rishis, Rishis of ten rays. So they join, they break through to the supermind, to the Svar world. And Svar world is actually the light is of the supermind, yes? It met the darkness, but it is still uninvolved yet light. It is that Indra's light, that luminous finger which fell and showed how everything is unreal, breaking through the ceiling of our, uh, uh, of our illumined mind down. And this is the completion of the Vedic um, kind of um, idea. So I'm kind of splitting them here, supermental over mind, over mind, intuitive mind, trirochanas, illumined mind, higher mind, mind, tisrodhyavach, the mental, vital, vital, physical, vital, trini rajansi, um, and then mental, physical, vital, physical, physical, tisrobhumi, three earths. There is a beautiful uh, picture of the mother um, by the, uh, with Huta, Mother gave her the colors, and Huda painted this beautiful um, holistic view of creation. And here you can see very interestingly from the inconscient, which is dark, blue and dark. Then we have physical red, then violet, vital, mind, our mind, higher mind and illumined mind. Notice they are all blue, blue, more blue, yeah? but all blue. This is our head, this is these um tisro diavach three heavens and then we break to trirojanas and here we are totally new color and um, we have intuitive mind yellow over mind many colored and sup supramental over mind is not listed here because over mind and supramental over mind they are in the same way and then there's super mind and one color golden liquid gold, and then beyond we have this saffron color you know, of that very beautiful color of India, which is, we didn't come up right here, bliss, and then consciousness, the silver, the, um, the liquid silver, and uh, then pure white existence, sat, unmanifest pure white, and then beyond there is someone, the Supreme Purushottama. So here I stop my presentation, and if there are some questions, remarks, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, Vladimir, thank you. It was uh, 
beyond profound. Now I guess uh, people know why I say spiritual toddler, but now I feel not even out of the womb. Uh, <laughs> so we would invite questions. Uh, if you want to raise your hand, please, uh, that would help us facilitate better. Uh, any questions <laughs> pertinent only to this session, please. So yeah, there is already a question. Maybe you can take it from JP Das. Okay. Uh, so Vladimir, uh, not sure if you can read it, but I'll read it for you. Why Surya is combined with Savitri to be called as the Lord of Creation? It's not just Surya, but Surya Savitri. So why? Very nice. Um, I love the question here. Um, Savitar is. Uh, actually, the distinction is made in the Veda. You can find it in the Veda games. Yeah? Um, Surya is the um, the Atma of the all. Yeah? Vishvasya Atma, the self of all. And Savitar is um, Vashi, Jagatah Vashi. He is the Lord of the universe. So there is a difference between self and the Lord. Shabindu makes this distinction. In the life divine, you will find it everywhere. The safe, the self, and the Lord. There is something about the self, the substance, the being, and there is something about consciousness acting on behalf of this being. That's why Surya Savitri. Yeah? Savitri is the Lord, whereas uh, Surya is the self, the body, if you wish. And of course, they go together because you cannot split the self and the consciousness and being is very difficult to split. So that's why she would to put them together. Yeah, yeah. But, thank you. Um, sir, I yeah. want to ask, what is this mm -hmm. number three? It means uh, three, always three lok. Or uh, means we are always counting in the uh, multiples of three. What is the significance of this number three? Well, uh, yeah, it's a big, profound question. We most probably will not cover the three. Three is actually the link between one and two. <laughs> one <laughs> plus two is three, <laughs> the simple answer. But uh, mm, truly speaking, it's more difficult to answer. Because three is a relation of one, oneself to oneself, so to say. The self-awareness is generating the delight, and that is three, if you will. It is always an outcome of self-awareness. So that's why Ananda is emanation of, of the Satchit. Satchit is to be first. Sat is to be aware of it himself and once he is aware of himself it emanates ananda ananda is actually the result of self-awareness of the being the more we are aware of ourselves the more we have bliss it's a simple formula yeah? so three is that ananda that emanation that result of you being aware of yourself it's always something which is produced as it were one plus two is three. Yeah? It's an outcome of something which is there before. So basically, we can say the steps in Satchit and then it resulting into Ananda, like that. Right, absolutely. Uh, otherwise, why should we put Satchit Ananda and not Ananda Chit Sat or something else? Mm -hmm. uh, there is, and it's very difficult to split them because impossible. This Trinity is uh, one. But still, we use our mind and we understand that the being is to be there for consciousness to be aware of. <laughs> How else would, what consciousness would be aware of if being is not there, yes? And that awareness of being is bliss. Results is bliss. Uh, myself, uh, can I ask uh, actually uh, one clarification I need? Myself, Devi Prasad Mishra, can I go ahead? Professor Devi, uh, Devi ji, uh, give me a minute, please. There's a question from Bala Sundari. We'll go step by step. Yeah, very, uh, very simple one question because I had been reading Vedic Suktas. There is a Suktam called Surya Savitri. 
So I could not just really relate it with the uh, Sherwin, the things that is shown here. If we can throw five minutes some light on Surya Savitri Vedic Sutta. But that's how Sri Aurobindo calls it. There are, there are hymns to Surya. Uh, we have them, yes. Uh, if you go to the Veda, yeah. if you don't go to the Veda, if you take Sri Aurobindo Surya Savitri, because he combined this. Yeah, for some time I was even thinking that Savitar represents the supramental of a mind for some time, because it is that action of Surya into the manifestation. And it's quite interesting, if you read the Savitar hymn, he, Savitar moves, uh, we have to read the whole hymn, yes? Avayami agnim prathavam suastaye. I invoke Agni first uh, for well-being, suastaye. Avayami Mitra Varuna Yehavase. I call to Mitra and Varuna here for, for fulfillment. Avayami Ratrim Jagatoni Veshanim. I invoke the night who introduces all the spirits into the manifestation. She is the location, that which will receive the light of Surya, yes? And Savitar will act there. And the whole hymn of Savitar, one. 35, we have to read through, and you will understand many things about Savitar. And Vayami um, Devam Savitaram Utaye, and I am calling to Deva, to the god Savitar, for help. And Savitar moves through these dark spaces to reach through to himself. This is his functionality as the Lord, as the consciousness of the sun, which meets the darkness. He pervades it and moves through it and generates. It's like with one hand, he pulls all the beings up in their involution, evolution, and the, in, with the other hand, he pulls them in with their involution. It's with two hands, he acts, we will have to read the hymn, but because of lack of time, I cannot go to it now. I, I don't think you, you will want to read the hymn now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe in our, in our studies, in our circle, we will do that. Sure. And um, we will understand yeah. why, how it differs from Surya. Sorry. Yeah, let's yeah. do that. Let's do yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, Balasundari, in case that doesn't uh, satisfy or sate your spiritual needs fully, we will talk about Aurochit at the end of the, the session today and we can come up with follow-up questions mm -hmm. there. Thank I'm you. very happy. I got some a little bit concept. It's a very deep philosophical because I had been reading uh, commentaries on Savitri by others like uh, Kapal Shastri and all. They are saying it is the Surya Savitri's incarnation that has come. So I got a little bit, and he's thrown sufficient light on it, and I'm very happy. I am from yeah, Ashram student. Oh, I'm from Ashram student. <laughs> thank okay. you very much. Yeah, thank you. And we'll keep moving and would request everyone to let's have it succinct uh, so that uh, we can, you know, honor the clock time as much as we get swayed by uh, the spirit. Uh, let's stay grounded. And Devi Ji, Professor Devi Prasad, uh, please go ahead. You had a question. I just uh, want to know the Savitri is basically the combination of the uh, Atman and the Maya. Is it so? Because that is the creation. Yeah, the problem with the Maya, again, Maya in the Veda is the creative mother. It's the mother. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, who creates the world. Uh, it's the first um, uh, over mental consciousness is Maya. And um, because of um, this impossibility to transform this life, uh, that, that the to turn was made towards the transcendental, yes? So bypassing the overmind, bypassing, and with overmind, supermind disappears altogether as unnecessary. Sun becomes a rather malefic, uh, some kind of, you know, graha, uh, rather than a, a supramental consciousness, because it is uh, generating heat uh, and so on. So it is treated differently in the post-Vedic tradition. You can see it immediately. Though there are still some memories, remnants, for example, Karna is the son of the sun, 
and he was born immortal. We don't pay attention to it, <laughs> but it is something really fascinating <laughs> that he was born immortal. Who was born immortal ever? Nobody. But Karna was immortal. But he gave up his immortality to, uh, to, for Arjuna to win because Arjuna was rising spirit, you know, and it was needed, that sacrifice of the supermind, which was too early for manifestation, was needed. Karna gave his life away for the rising. It's very interesting to, to uh, observe this. So I cannot answer immediately, but something of the kind that Surya plus creation is Savitar. In the Vedic terms. Yeah, we can take these kind of questions later also. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Deviji. And uh, thank you, Vladimir. One last question before we move on to Alokda today. Um, so this is from Manjit. I'll read it out for you, Vladimir. Is there any book being written by Sri Aurobindo which tells us directly about the distinctions of the mind and the chakras of the body? And how can common people try and know to distinguish between them? It's a, actually in the mother you will find this more. Uh, Shubhendu also speaks on the chakras here and there, yes, but in in relation to uh, to practice of meditation and how to concentrate and how the force descends from chakra, because the whole idea of descent is found only in the Veda. Um, in the post-Vedic, you hardly find it anywhere. Yes, it's more Kundalini awakening and rising from below, but not Mahakundalini descending from above. But in the Veda, we have this idea common all the time, bring here down the gods. Yeah? So the gods have to be brought down by the flame. There is a call and the, the flame goes up and brings the gods down. And this, um, with this descent down, the chakras are open one by one. There is a beautiful several passages in Savitri and how the, all the centers of subtle body are, are open up. So, um, and in the mother, this explanation of the 12 chakras is amazing because then we have the full picture of the Vedic vision. Yeah? Before, we don't really, we can't understand uh, what are these three rochanas? What is this overmind with triple overmind is doing there? But these are three levels, three chakras which are above our head yeah transcendental so any, any, so any specific book vladimir that was the question for complete works of mother under the any volume or i don't have it with we, me we, to we can share you. these references in our whatsapp group later so yeah. Yeah, look, right. yeah. Yeah, i think manjit mm -hmm. you're with us anyway we'll take care of that so thank you vladimir uh, thank you very much um for uh, gracing us with your uh, presence and this beautiful session